which would basically cover the entire range that a page table would have mapped to with individual 4K pages. Now instead you're just mapping to that entire range. And this is, of course, a much simpler analogy. It's like a library and a giant scroll, right? If you want to find stuff in the giant scroll, you just, uh, you just go find it. That was the innovation of caged books. Less scrolling. All right. So there we go. Now we have a new page directory entry. But there is no page table, so we don't need to know anything about a new page table entry. New page directory entry, this is where all of a sudden the global bit starts mattering, right? So we saw before the previous type of PDE, it said the global bit doesn't do anything, don't care. This PDE, global page does actually matter. So, and the other thing is that that page size bit that existed in either of them, the key point is this is interpreted, these four bytes are interpreted as this type of structure if that page size bit equals one, right? If it's page size zero, then you know you're pointing at some page table. If it's page size one, you know that you're going to be pointing at a four megabyte address, which are four megabyte aligned, and therefore you don't need to specify, you know, 20 bits like before. You only actually need to specify, what is it, 10? Yep. You only need to specify 10 bits, and you assume the, all the bottom bits are zero. And so a large page must start on a four megabyte aligned chunk. All right. And so most everything else is all the same here. The one thing we will see is, let me think of how I was saying this. This question came up when someone was looking at these slides on their own. For this first thing, once we're saying that because the D and PAT bits are in this, it's kind of like combining a PDE and PT. Some of the fields, like the dirty bit, right? So this dirty bit existed before in the page table entry, right? But now that we have no page table, see the page table entry was trying to say something about the page you pointed at. It's trying to say this is dirty because it's been written to, right? But now the page directory entry points at a page, so it still needs to be able to convey that same sort of information. So we took some of the bits which would have been in the page table entry, we put them in the page directory entry. Uh, and so it's kind of like we've uh, squished together the functionality of page tables and page directories into this one entry. And then also there's that page table attribute index, which we didn't care about because it was something to do with caching. caching. All right, and again, just once more to reiterate, you may not use these large pages unless you had CR4 set to PSE, right? So the, that's why these are called control registers. You cannot use this capability unless you set the right control thing. And so then the big question is, why do you want uh, ginormous pages? Right? You don't deal with these in OS classes and stuff like that for simplification reasons. So why do you want them? I'm just going to say this verbatim, as they said it, plenty fine. Right? When the PSE flag is in CR4 is set, meaning you know, we can use large pages, both 4 megabyte pages and page, page tables for 4 kilobyte pages can be accessed from the same page directory. Right, so page directory can at the same time have some page directory entries which point at page tables and some page directory entries which point directly to giant pages. Right, so that's the first thing. And how does the hardware know which is which is based on that page size bit, right? If the hardware sees page size is zero, it assumes I got to take a physical address, get a page table. If it sees page size is one, it assumes, hey, there's some big four, uh, one, four megabyte aligned giant page. All right, so both of these things can exist in the page table at the same time. If the PSE flag is clear, only tables for four kilobyte pages can be accessed, regardless of the setting of the PS flag. So again, if CR4 has disabled page, large pages by turning off the PSE flag, then yeah, the hardware doesn't care if you actually set, hey, I've got a large page here. Hardware knows, back in the control register, it says, no, there's no such thing as a large page. I don't even need to check that bit. So a typical example of mixing four kilobyte and four megabyte pages is to place the operating system or executive's kernel in a large page to reduce TLB misses and thus improve, improve overall system performance. So we're almost to the point where we really have to talk about TLBs. Well, let's see, is it even the next slide? Yeah. So, okay, so just keep that in mind for, you know, a minute. This page, large pages has something to do with decreasing 
a TLB misses. So it means something about you'll more often than not have a cached entry which says, you know, this virtual goes to that physical. Because that's what the TLB is all about. And you can kind of see that intuitively, right? If you've got a giant chunk of memory which is covered by one virtual to physical and then you just take the bottom 22 bits and use that as an offset, because that's what we saw up here, right? We had 10 bits to say here's the start of a page and then we had 22 bits that say here's the offset into that 4 megabytes, right? So if you've got a huge region and you've cached for everything in that region, it's all about that entire 4 megabytes a virtual memory space caches to this same 4 megabytes of physical. So now you know, like, anytime you access anywhere within that large memory region, you're going to go ahead and have a cache hit, right? But when you have tiny little pages, right, and you've got 4 megabytes of space, right, you don't know whether any given chunk of that 4 megabytes is hit. You need more TLB entries. You need more things kicked out, et cetera. But, uh, okay. And and then the only other thing we need to know is that the processor, processor maintains separate TLBs for 4 megabyte pages and 4 kilobyte pages. So there's one cache which maps, you know, the upper 20 bits of a physical address to the upper 20 bits of a virtu virtual address, for, sorry, virtual to physical, right? In 4 kilobyte pages, we've got 20 bits is, you know, the upper portion and 12 bits is an offset, right? So you take the upper 20 of virtual, upper 20 of physical, and you cache the mapping between those and you treat the bottom 12 as just an offset into that page. There's a completely separate cache that takes the upper 10 and the upper 10 and maps those to each other and treats the bottom 22 as a giant offset into that page. So two separate caches for four megabytes. So big pages and little pages, basically. We'll see also in the PAE case, big pages, little pages. All right, so now we've got to talk about the TLB and this will get us to understanding Shadow Walker. All right, TLB is an in-CPU cache, so it's actually, you know, with the rest of the CPU. It's, uh, it keeps these translations between linear AK virtual addresses and physical addresses. Uh, and the point is that, you know, the hardware doesn't have to want to, doesn't want to do multiple memory accesses each time, right? Because remember, if CR3 says go to this physical address, it's like the hardware would have to go out to memory read back in, you know, the physical address information for the entire page directory, right? Depending on, well, not necessarily. If it already calculated the offset, it could just read back in that 4 megabytes per page directory entry. But it has to go out to memory, get a page directory entry. Go out to memory, get a page table entry. Go out to memory, get the page and, you know, plus the offset. So get the data at the page plus offset. So that's three memory accesses, right? If instead we've got a tiny little cache off here to the side, you can just say if virtual to physical is in this cache, go directly to the final page and add the offset and just read. So it's three memory accesses versus one. Remember, the stuff on cache is way faster than the stuff in memory is way faster. You know, hard drive, you've got your memory hierarchy there, right? So if you can have just a little bit of space that's super fast, that saves you from having to do three memory accesses despite them being, you know, relatively fast, they're still way slower than cache access. So you can save a bunch of time by not having the hardware walk every time. That's the whole point of the TLB. Yep, so I already said you basically just need to take whatever top many bits pertain to the base address of a page. So it's 20 bits if it's a 4 kilobyte page, 10 bits if it's a, uh, it's a large page. And this is just saying the offset is 12 when, you know, if you have 20 and 12 is 32. You've got 10 and 22 is 32. So eventually you're always making it to 30. And I guess here I was making the point that this is sort of similar to the way that way back in segmentation we said you can set segment registers. But the hardware doesn't want to have to check the GDT every time, right? So when you set a segment register, you say CS has a segment selector which points at index 1 in the GDT. And index 1 has a segment descriptor. And we said that in reality, the hardware doesn't want to have to, you know, read the GDT and read the information and then calculate a linear address each time. So what the GDT can, what the hardware can do is for segmentation, it has a hidden part of the segment registers, right? Where it just takes the entire segment descriptor, which was stored in the GDT, and stores that to a cached area. So no longer for segmentation does it have to walk tables. 
It just says, okay, if this is CS and that's the cache thing, I know the base is in my cache, so just base plus offset, bam, right? No table walking after the first access. Same thing, you know, you're essentially getting the base plus an offset into the page, no more uh, table walking after the first access. All right, so this is kind of how you can visualize it uh, conceptually. There's, in reality, I think I wanted to update this to add in things like global and stuff like that. But uh, the key point here is you may have, you know, some virtual address 4F007700, right? That's your full virtual address. But what the hardware does is it says, for this linear address, before I do that 10, 10, 12 chunking or whatever, I'm going to actually first do a grab the top 20 bits, right, that 10 and 10, 20 bits, take that and see if it's in my cache. And my cache just says, you know, 20 bits to 20 bits, here's the virtual, there's the physical, and if it's in my cache, right, so 4F007, that's in my cache, that maps to 2 bad 1, physical, and so I, all I need to do is go ahead and add the offset, and bam, I know virtual, 4F007700 maps to 2 bad 1, 7. Nice simple way to bypass all that work of walking access. And so what I conceptually, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. In terms of things we've already talked about, what I really should have here is something like add columns. Right, so you can think of there also being these little things like, you know, is this global or not? Oh, that's terrible, but it also doesn't work. You can think of there being also, you know, fields in the TLB where there's going to be for each cache entry, right, it's going to say, is this global or not? And based on that information, so at the time when it caches it, it consults the, you know, page table entry, something like that, and it says, okay, this is global, so mark it as global in the TLB. The next time you set CR3 to whatever, don't kick it out. But everything else that's, you know, not global, kick it out. There's also, I believe, the notion of just straight up, is it valid or not? So we said before there's a manual instruction that the OS can call when it like pages something out to disk. It needs to invalidate this TLB entry, right? To say like, no, that's, you know, no longer valid. So rather than, for instance, like zeroing out the cache entry, I assume that something like a valid bit on each entry, right? So if you say invalidate that entry, then it goes ahead and it, you know, virtually clears it out in the same way that, you know, when you delete a file on the file system, you don't overwrite it unless you explicitly say it. The OS is trying to be you know, lazy and simple about it. It just says, if you ask me to delete a file, I'll just mark somewhere in some, you know, file system information. Okay, that memory space is available now. Similarly, I'd expect you'd see the same thing, like, you're just marking a flag that says, okay, that TLB cache entry is available now. So the next time it's looking for some place to cache something, it says, is that valid? If so, you know, don't overwrite it. But if it's not valid, go ahead and, you know, enter your new cache information. I'll have to make a slide like that after I look if that's actually the case. Conceptually, since that's not an accurate representation, this is just what you need to think about for the TLB. Certainly the case. All right. So this is where we officially say that whenever CR3 is set to a new value, all TLBs, entries which are not marked as global, get flushed from the cache. And the other point there is only ring zero is allowed to move into the CR3 register. So that just goes along with what we've been saying about the kernel, setting up different virtual memory spaces for things and swapping between them by setting CR3, stuff like that. User space can't set your control register. Ring zero code is also the only code which is allowed to use the invalidate page uh, instruction. So this invul page 
right, is the specific instruction where you can issue that when you're ring zero and say, or virtual address, you say invalidate page 4F007700. You say that, and then the hardware is going to say, I will go down to my TLB. I will check if that's cached. If so, mark it as invalid, you know, usable, whatever. That can be reused in the So the kernel needs to do that, you know, for housekeeping anytime a uh, cache mapping becomes a or for instance, that copy on write. Yeah, it, like in that copy on write case, right? We said something writes to some memory that's shared, but the OS, you know, goes and gives it a copy at some other virtual address. If the OS doesn't like kick out that old mapping before it puts in this new one, right? The hardware will just go back to that old mapping. So the, for housekeeping purposes, OS needs to know how to evict things from the TLB at its leisure. An interesting question which I've heard in the past is, and it's a valid question, is what about those global entries? How do you ever get rid of the global entries, right? Changing around CO3 doesn't do it. Invalidating page could do it, but what if you want to like get rid of everything? Actually, does invalidate page do it? I think it does. So what if you just want to like wholesale invalidate everything, right? Turns out what you have to do is go back to that control register or and set that page global bit to zero, right? So you're like saying, no, there's no longer the capability to use global pages. Set it to zero, set it back to one, but when it got set to zero, all the TLB entries are. All right, so we already saw that there's multiple TLBs in the sense that there's big page, little page TLBs. There's also multiple TLBs in the sense that there's data TLBs and instruction TLBs. Getting tantalizingly close now. All right, so data TLBs, we know that the hardware has different notions of data access versus code access. Therefore, if you're issuing an instruction like a jump, it, the hardware knows that is a code access thing. You're jumping. It's reading in data from the address which EIP is pointing to and it's executing some code there. It keeps that in its notion of code access, because otherwise it wouldn't be able to do those things like, you know, not executable data segments, right? If you have a notion of what it means to access something. So it's got a different notion of code versus data. And so if you go out with jumps and calls and returns, those sort of virtual addresses are going to get cached in the data TLB or DTL. All of, wait, sorry, instruction TLB. Those sort of things will be in the ITLB, instruction TLB, and all of your other data accesses where you just move from memory to register, move from register to memory, all that stuff gets cached in the DTLB. So whatever virtual addresses you're accessing there, it goes in the DTLB. So this means we end up with four total TLBs, right? Data small, data large, uh, instruction small, instruction large. We said Shadow Walker gets to the point of trying to trick these mappings so that uh, when security tool comes along and reads all virtual memory, it's trying to you know, redirect reads of memory versus execution. It wants its execution to work fine so it can run its own code, but it wants your read of its memory to fail so <coughs> that you can't find it with your little signature. All right, so just for, um, just for approximation purposes, so you have a sense of the size of TLBs, at least on my, uh, I don't think, okay, that was my home machine. Yeah, that's not this machine. This one's a Core i7. I think. That's all right. Uh, so on this uh, older Core 2 Duo, the data TLB for the small entries had 256 entries, right? So I can store 256 mappings from a small page in virtual to a small page in physical. And I can store 32 mappings for a big page in virtual to big page uh, physical. Right? And so you can kind of see why you would need many more uh, cache entries when you're doing like little bit, little bit, little bit. You've got big swaths of memory. And yeah, you don't need so many caches. Right? All right. Similarly, instruction TLB, it's got 128 entries. And the ITLB, this is probably because of the notion that you're probably accessing many fewer addresses like in complete memory spaces with execution than you are with data, right? Data may be pulling from the globals and then pulling from the, you know, read only, read write data and then pulling from the, you know, 
import address table, whatever else, right? So data access is probably bopping around a lot more than code access, which is probably in some small region of memory. Typically going linear, occasionally jumping off to something else, coming back, right? So you need less uh, instruction caches than data caches. So finally to the point where we can actually do this. Really curious how much more I have to do. Really need to speed up. So Shadow Walker, the whole point is that it's it's targeting TLB manipulation, right? It wants to hide itself in virtual memory from something. Not gonna work for physical memory, but yes, virtual memory, you scan all virtual memory, you can't find it. So it exploits the fact that we have different instruction versus data access. And in order to make itself execute normally, it hooks the page fault handler, which we already heard about a bit. And so it intercepts page faults. When a page fault happens, you know, it handles it before it passes it off to the OS, right? And so in particular, when a page fault hand happens first, it's saying, you know, what was, we know that the CR2 register holds the instruction which caused the page fault, right? So when it's trying to execute its own code, the instruction should be in the range of its own memory it's protecting. When some other thing is trying to access its code, the instruction should be outside of its memory range, right? So you've got Shadow Walker here in its little page of memory. When it tries to execute itself, it checks the, in the page fault handler, where did this execution come from? And, uh, and what I should have said is, you know, the reason it's checking is because in between its running, it sets itself as not paged in, right? So it can set itself as not present, Right? So it says, okay, I've ran, I'm done, you know, yield to the system, but before I go, I'm going to set myself as non-present, right? And so I'll resume sometime later. It sets itself as non-present, therefore, anytime some code access to it or data access to it happens, it's going to go ahead and cause a page fault, right? It wants a page fault to happen because the page fault redirects to itself. And when it redirects to itself as the page fault handler, then it says, okay, was someone else trying to access me or was I trying to access me? Right? And if I'm trying to access my own code because I'm trying to execute, go ahead and make the correct, you know, instead of saying it's not present, go ahead and map it correctly to the right physical address where my code is. If someone else is trying to access me, go ahead and map it to just some junk physical address, whatever, right? So find my page table entry and just, you know, pick a random address and point it at that, right? Point it at zero or whatever. And so in that way, you're scanning virtual memory, you don't Notice this because the page faults all happen behind the scenes, right? You're not aware of page faults. The OS is trying to make that as transparent as possible. But because this pa malicious page fault handler is catching this, it's going to go ahead and make it so that transparently you've been redirected to jump. And when it tries to execute itself, transparently it's executed to its real code. So that's the point here. That's what the ASCII art of doom is all about, right? So memory access, VPN 12, it's saying, do you have a question? I just wonder if they predict the page fault handler as well from... Uh... Right, do they protect the page fault? Originally, right, so he's, his point is, can someone go look at the page fault and see that, like, you know, the page fault handler and see that someone's intercepting it? Yes, they can, because they're not actually protecting it. This original version was actually just a uh, proof of concept. It only protected even one page memory, right? Uh, but actually, Corey uh, updated it to handle more memory and stuff like that. And what else did you fix, Corey? What else? Oh, that's right. He doesn't have. Okay, just multiple pages. So, so yes, it doesn't protect it, and it's therefore, if you go look at the page fault handler, you'll see this thing is hooking the page fault handler. Of course, there's a new attack that we found recently which could actually hide the fact that it's hooking the page fault handler depending on how you we'll talk about that when we get to interrupts. But the point is, this right here is saying, you know, I am a page fault handler. And I see that the page fault just occurred. It's accessing VPN virtual page number. So that number is just the top 20 bits or whatever. VPN 12, so you're trying to access 12, 0, 0, 0, 0 whatever. Uh, is this an instruction access or is this a data access? If it is a instruction access, then go ahead, change the page tables so that they map to the correct frame one, right? So virtual page number 12 maps to frame number one 
and then you know go ahead allow that access and the ITLB will cache that so that you know it just works from now on. But when it's done access when it's done running, set itself back to not present so that if someone comes along and tries to read its memory, you get a page fault and it says, is this data access? If so, you know, just pick some random frame to map in the page table, and then that random frame will get cached, and therefore forevermore until that page table entry gets evicted, that mapping between virtual and physical will be there. So when whatever you know, security tool comes along, it's going to be reading the wrong physical. Right? And so security tools, which don't know this, could be you know saying, oh well, we scan memory for malware, right? But are you Because if it's virtual and you're not aware of this thing, then they're hidden. Alright, so, but it is eminently defeatable. So, like most rootkit techniques, when you know what they're doing, them some really kind of techniques, and anything not really meant to be particularly uh, malicious. So, step one, they, they hook to the interrupt descriptor table entry for the page fault handler. So, normally, when we get to interrupt tables in the next section, Normally, interrupt table says, oh, go here in the OS to handle the page fault, right? So if that entry is not pointing into the OS, then, you know, it's pretty obvious that someone has modified it. Check that. They could, you know, they could have modified the implementation and instead of hooking the table entry, they could have went to the actual target of the table and put in a jump instruction, for instance, which jumps up to the thing. But both of those are eminently checkable, right? You can look at the entries and you can look at the code at the target of the entry and understand whether those are good or not. Of course, if you only look at the first couple instructions as some things do, some things just look, is there a jump instruction in the first you know, couple instructions? Well, obviously they can move it down some. You really have to check all of code in order to see if something look at some offset, right? But that's one way. Check IDT, check, you know, for inline handlers or something like that. I guess that's the second bullet point. Integrity check the memory to see if the when you when you target this page fault handler, go read all of that memory and say, is that hash what we expect? All right. Another thing a security tool tool could do is just you know dump the entire TLB before it even runs. Right? Turn off you know the page global bit so that everything is destroyed. Yes, you'll have a little bit of a performance overhead as you know the hardware walks some tables, but it turns out I mean the point is if this is like security tool which is walking all of memory anyways. There's not enough TLB entries to handle all of those mappings of virtual to physical. So that sort of thing is already incurring a bunch of cache misses, right? So it's, you know, it's the difference between whatever, so one million. It's the difference between, you know, potentially up to one million TLB misses versus one million minus 256, right? So go ahead and dump the entire TLB before you start scanning virtual memory, and then you don't have to worry about this. Or scan physical memory, right? And how can you scan physical memory? Like we talked about before, grab yourself a free virtual memory page. Grab one virtual memory page to map in page tables. Well, you don't even really need. Actually, in this case, sorry, I'm thinking of a different context. In this case, you literally only need one free virtual memory address, right? So one entire page of things, and then you go to your own um, page table, page directory, and you say, okay, well, I see that address. X9000000. No one's using that right now. Present bit is zero. Okay. So I can use that, and then I go to the page table entry for 90000, and I say this maps to physical address one. Scan it. This maps to physical address two. Scan it. Maps to physical address three. Right. So you can just iterate over all of physical. You have to use CPU ID in order to see what the maximum physical address is. But you could just you know map. One virtual address to every possible physical address, one physical address at a time, or you know, make some contiguous three or five or whatever, so you don't miss. Assuming you're doing signature scanning, you don't want to mess, you know, things that are on page boundaries. Or scanning anyways. And theoretically, you could profile paging performance and see, hey, it looks like my page fault handler takes a lot longer. Wouldn't necessarily be a lot longer. The question of would it take longer enough that you could see it really looks like, you know, if I keep marking something as invalid and I keep you know, checking it, does it take longer than a click? But the other ways of detecting it are so simple that I don't. 
All right, so before we go on to PIE, we've now covered paging for 3232 32 kilobyte, paging for 3232 32 4 megabyte. Does anyone have any questions on these? We also covered TLB, right? Now TLB is just a mapping, it's just a cache to give us virtual to physical without having to even bother with those tables. But you know, the OS still has to set those tables up at least once in order for the hardware to walk them, cache them, yes. How much efficiency is the overall TLB adding or the global entries add? I, I can see why the global entries would yeah. add a lot. Yeah. Do the local entries add a lot or is this mostly libraries on the Exactly. It all depends about you know this, you know, caching is never meant to, you know, help with everything, right? But the point is they would have done profiling, right? They would have done profiling on normal code things and they'd say based on our profiling. If we give, you know, 256 entries and we assume that, you know, maybe 200 of them are useful for non-global memory, right? and, and again, remember when we were talking about 4 megabyte pages, we said that typically the key point you're going to use them for is the OS, right? So the OS itself is going to be often the big page thing, right? So that's all covering things. So maybe most of those 256 little pages are being used by the, the application. So, you know, in terms of you know, absolute numbers, only Intel knows how much more efficient it is in terms of having this or that many cache entries. Can't really answer that. All right, any other questions before we go on? About TLBs? Web page, web page, addresses, virtual. Anyone on the phone? All right, so I'm just going to answer this even though I see you've been answering your own stuff before. <coughs> so what is the typical real world use for kilobyte versus four megabyte pages? So that was, we said that the whole point of, so okay, now that we've talked about TLB, they said in the manual, they said, Intel said, you know, maybe, hey, kernel developers, hint, hint, maybe you want to map your kernel into four megabyte pages, right? The real world use of four megabyte versus four kilobyte pages, and this is the case in Windows, Windows will map chunks of NTUS kernel.exe or other variants of the kernel into four megabyte pages. So if you go look at the PTE entry, run that PTE command on the kernel itself, maybe I should do that quick, but let me explain first. If you run that on the kernel itself, what you would expect is this entire 4 megabyte range that takes up a good chunk of the kernel is all one big page. The reason you want to do that is so that anywhere within that 4 megabyte page range is all just one cached entry in large page TLB. That's why we have large page versus small. So now anytime you're accessing anywhere within that kernel space, which is you know obviously heavily used, so I'll Dave, what sort of race conditions were you thinking on the TLB? Like races between what and what? Because there's kind of only uh, one memory access for these non memory management bits. In. I'll look at your answer there. Um, again, we said the kernel is mapped into all these processes, right? And we said the point of that was so that this guy can call APIs and that guy. So this is being used for all of the management of switching around different processes. So whenever it's doing, kernel's doing its own thing, it's mapped into memory, right? And you want it to be the case that for all of those accesses, you don't have to actually uh, consult the tables, right? Just go to the TLB and then bam, right there, off. Right? So you want these accesses to be, you know, independently, you want those accesses to be, you know, plenty fast. And all of this time that all of these processes are calling into the kernel, you want those to be pretty fast. So one, the kernel is mapped into this large page, so the TLB entries for you know large chunks of the kernel are always uh, less TLB caches for that, but covering so much memory that you don't really. So that is 
that is the reason why four megabyte pages are used, for instance, on NQS kernel.exe. Right, so in terms of on separate CPUs, that's a good question. Um, and I think that would essentially come down to the fact that it, it does get into this fact of is the CPU architecture such that everyone ends up going through the same memory management unit or is it the case that you know each of them can independently go to memory at their leisure. So in like I said like as was apparent yesterday I'm obviously not familiar enough with like, and stuff like that to say that when everybody you know when every core can go to memory at with its own hardware Right, that's different. And when when all the cores are going to you know one memory, unit, right? Then yes, each CPU will have its own caching sort of thing. But in terms of race conditions, you know, the memory management unit is only letting one person, you know, one core access the memory. Only the memory management unit can. Give it time, right? So. So there. I'm not sure if that's on the hardware or if that's on the OS to update it between CPUs. I'm pretty sure it's on the OS that OS, yeah, I think <coughs> the coordination for that is on the OS so that between the CPUs, they need to make sure that when one guy's, you know, virtual to physical gets updated, uh, assuming all the CPUs are in the same context, right? That's really the issue here. That, a race condition type scenario, you would only see if CPU 1 and CPU 2 are both on the same CR3, right? So they're both, you know, telling the memory management unit, here's where you find my memory, right? And, no, so that's not a problem though, because even if they're on the same CR3, they're pointing at the same memory. So when one thing gets updated, okay. But no, though. I'm going to just uh, punt on that and not, uh, not misdescribe things. My thought is that I believe it's going to be something that's on the OS to uh, coordinate things, but simultaneously it seems like memory management unit saying, hey, you probably should have picked that cache entry. Now. That's what we said before. The instruction, that's the point of the instruction is that you can say what you do or don't want to evict it. And then, Jessica said, yes, there are covert channels in there with the shared TMBs. Thing is, on multiple CPUs, you don't really have shared TLBs. Um, And Corey was pointing out that there is a Windows API to, to uh, map physical memory to memory. That's called MMMAP IO space. Is that accurate? Saying that MMMAP IO space is that physical memory to virtual So he's saying MMMAP IO space is used. So you can call MMMAP IO space and you can say, I want this virtual memory to be mapped. And he said it's also used for memory mapped I.O. So like when you're talking to a device and stuff like that, right? sometimes you're quote writing to memory, but in reality you're writing out to a you know, buffer on a network card or something like that. So, so he's saying this and then map I.O. can be map virtual to physical of your desired thing, right, without going out and doing all this manual manipulation of, of page tables and page directories also be used for uh, memory maps I.O. to devices. All right, good point. All right, so we are on to PAE. So if someone has any other questions or comments. All righty, so PAE is a hardware supported way to access more than four gigabytes of RAM. Point is, People are running 32-bit operating systems. They don't want to make the jump to 64-bit. A bunch of their operate, you know, programs don't work, and programs haven't ported themselves to Windows 64. So, but say you still want to access more than four gigs of RAM, right? You're doing you know, heavy-duty video editing, or computational processing, as far as less RAM, etc. 
So PAE, physical address extensions, gives you the ability to potentially access up to 236 bits, uh, bytes of memory. So one key point is that Windows uses a different kernel name with, you know, different essentially internal memory management knowledge when it's uh, using PAE names. That's actually called ntkernelpa.exe rather than the traditional NTOS kernel.exe. So one point here is if you enable what Windows calls depth data execution protection, which all of our machines here have that enabled. When you enable DEP, it also enables PIE because it turns out that the core hardware uh, capability to do this non-executable memory, which is what data execution prevention gives you, the core capability is only available in PIE page directories, page tables, uh, and something that comes via before page directories. So you have to change your memory management method over to using PAE before you can say this page of memory is readable and writable but not executable. All right. And DEP is enabled by default for at least some services and therefore, you know, for the overall system, it loads this other kernel uh, post XPSD2. So when you're running a thing and if you don't specifically say turn off PAE, it's running after SP2 and you're probably running a PAE. That you need to know that so that when you drop your debugger into the kernel memory on that system, you know you need to start interpreting things in terms. So, similar looking table to before, but one extra level of indirection. Right? So, that much more important that you have <coughs> TLB caches between virtual and physical, one less memory access. So, as before, CR3. Uh, well, not not as before, sorry. This is really where the difference is. CR3 now points to uh, something which points to the page directory. So it's the page directory pointer table. So there's only, so you see there with that line coming down, there's only two bits here which specify whether or not the most significant two bits, say this table entry is pointing at, you know, one of four different uh, page directories. Each page directory is slightly smaller. Uh, you've got nine bits of indexing instead of ten. Right? Each page table, nine bits of indexing instead of ten. But then you finally end up with just a 12-bit uh, offset at the end because you've again got four kilobyte pages at the very end and you need all four kilobytes to access, you know, the last byte of So does anyone see any problems with this? for accessing 64 gigs of memory. Someone else pointed this out the other class, yes? Ah. Uh, if we get 36, I mean, you have a 32-bit address. Okay. You are starting with the 32-bit address. Okay, but why can't my 32 map to 36? Yeah. Same amount number of bits of information going through the location. I, I, I'm not saying what you're yeah. getting here. That's right. Yeah, it's still 32, right? And yeah. if you look at this little calculation down here, that's right. Two to 20 pages down here. I mean, our pages were still claiming our four kilobytes. Okay. So, what? Big pages is a separate thing. But yes, you couldn't use big pages because we saw before when you go to big pages, you got to get rid of the page table. All it's really giving you is, you know, take everything a page table would have mapped to and call that one big page. So no, that won't help either. Right, so, let's see. Yeah. Uh, so you can't actually get 64 gigabytes of memory out of it. So, where's the beef? Uh, but you, of course, didn't really think that you were going to map from 32-bit space 1 to 1 to 36-bit. Except you did, which I did, until I finally, you know, got around to really thinking about it, right? So you cannot have a one-to-one -one mapping of my 32-bit space to 4-bit space. All, it, all you can do is you can map one 32-bit space to a 32-bit chunk of a 36-bit space, right? So essentially what this means is you can have one 4-gigabyte window at a time in the 36-bit space, and your OS can know about that, right? And the OS is like, yeah, awesome. When I need more frames, I got them up there. Let me just slide that window over, right? 
But the point is, at any given time, you're still a 32-bit offset OS. You've still got 32-bit linear address space. You can't map it to that larger space. This is a key point. You're like, yeah, I've got 64 gigs of RAM, but unless your OS is actually, you know, first of all, it only means your OS can access, you know, four gig slices of that at a time. Second of all, it turns out XP doesn't. So, uh, like I said, there's a, a good link from Roman that I get a hold of. I have to send out people, uh, which shows for every different Windows OS, whether, you know, in PAE mode, whether it can access more than four gigabytes. XP, you know, none of them can. I think 2003 server something was like one of the first that could, or maybe it was like things like Vista and Win 7, I'm pretty sure that when you 32 bit version still will use PAE, but it actually will uh, access more memory. So, in that sense, it turns out that the Um, so it turns out that <clears throat> the only reason Windows goes to using PAE, it's not so that they can access four gigabyte slices of a 64 gigabyte range at a time. It's only so that, well, I can't say it's only so a developer, but it seems to be primarily the case that it's in order to enable depth, they had to go PAE in order to get to use this new bit, this non-executable bit. Yes? So in Windows XP, if I enable PA, let's say six gigs of RAM in the system, yep, doesn't matter. Computers, that's like there's four. All right, so that was why Roman was pointing it out. Is that he's like, uh, you said PA mode lets me access, you know, more RAM. And I've got more RAM than four gigs. Windows isn't reporting it. Is it just you know not reporting it, or what's the deal? And I was like, yeah, it's probably just not reporting it or something. And he looked it up, and yeah, it just simply doesn't. Upgrade. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, the point is here, even if the OS was using it, right, and these other <laughs> newer versions which do use it, even if you're using it, it doesn't help an individual process. Uh, address spaces, right? It only helps the OS who gets, you know, a bunch more physical frames to work with so that when they run out of stuff, they have to, you know, kick stuff to disk that much less. That's the whole point of why you install more RAM. You know, you want it to page less, right? But unless the OS is PAE aware, and if it's specifically trying to use all of this space and swapping around its, you know, four gigabyte slices, then you're not actually getting it. There was no concept of PAE in 64 bit or hmm. pure 64 bit, but it's obviously. No, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Jump back down to 32 bit compatibility modes. I don't believe you can PAE on top of that. Um, yes. It turns out what we'll see here is that the PDEs and PTEs are like 64 bits long and stuff. And it turns out, it turns out like right now, you know, essentially these structures, I believe, are used for both PAE and 64 bit. Right now, it's just that the max physical address bits are like scaled down to 20 bits or 36. 24 bits instead of, you know, previously it was 20 bits plus 12 is 32. That's 24 plus 12 is 36. But you've moved to 64 bit page directory entries, etc. Yeah, so what was the point of paging the page table layout? The OS wanted blah, blah, blah. Just so you can use more physical RAM. Yeah, so I said what's the point of changing the layout, but I didn't change the layout yet. So this is the new KE. Layouts. We start with this thing. This was that first initial little uh, only four entries kind of thing. The page directory pointer table entry. So for each of those four slots in this initial table, of which the top two bits index these four things, it has this format. And so here, you know, this bottom stuff looked mostly the same. We added some more flags. Previously, you know, the CR3 had like that. Everything else was fine. Second. Nah, go ahead. So why are we wasting so many when we could? That's what the thing, well, no, why are we wasting, say again? The, um, 
Now, all of these bits that we're not using space. Yep. And theoretically, theoretically, it could address larger space if they wanted to add that. That's why it doesn't actually say four bits in the says max fizz adder. Right? So if they wanted, they could, you know, kick this up at some point, with, you know, really found that no one was moving to 64 bits, but they really kept wanting to buy more RAM, right? <coughs> then Intel could update things and say, oh, got this chip and you can access, you know, one terabyte of RAM while still running your 32-bit operating system as long as Microsoft does your operating system. But they're not, so this is kind of just a hack to get you, you know, who really won't upgrade to COVID operating system for application request reason or an intermediate step. But simultaneously, I'm fairly certain that the uh, COVID page is back I can say that since I haven't really looked at 64 in depth. So anyways, one thing to point out, it's not on these, before they switched over the, the way that they display these things, the new manuals show this, the old ones don't, but this top bit of the page directory, page table, has this thing called the XD bit, the execute disable. On Intel, uh, this is a bit which sets this, page, the, the eventual page that this maps to may not be executable, right? And as before, if it's set on some high level place, if it's set early, right, if you set it here, all of this stuff, when you eventually get to a thing, it's all not executable. Set it in the page directory, all of the page table entries are not executable. And if you set it on the page table entry, that one page is not executable. So it's like the other ones in that the earliest it's set, it you know propagates out to everything and overrides it all. <coughs> that is when it's set, not you know, unset doesn't override set, just set overrides unset. So anyways, things are mostly the same in terms of down here, you know, all this present, read, write, user supervisor, cache. Access, access, available, hard-coded to zero. What were those before? Those were, or that one of them was like global before, yeah, that one was global before, but now they're Dirty or something? What? Was it like dirty before? Well, not on the page directory. Okay. So it really doesn't matter what they're set before. It mostly looks the same, a little bit of variation, right? The key point here is just they didn't have four bits of space in all of these things, right? If they had four bits of space laying around, they could have got away with keeping these four byte things, right? But if we go way back to a page table entry, right? The question is, if you want to access, you need four more bits in order to access a 24-bit physical address with the bottom where do you get them? Well, you've got 20 here, and you need four more. Okay, you can get three here. There's three available. So 9, 10, and 11. You can get those bits. That gets you to 23 bits. There's no other unused bit. That A is accessed. That's available. All right, so sorry. You're one bit shy. Got to go to big data structure. The page directory entry could have done it. See this one? Got three bits there, 9, 10, and 11. And then there's this available bit there. So close. Yes? Why do we see it from version 35 and 7? That's a good question. I don't know. It's not as a 30. Yeah. I don't know what the question is. You know, maybe. I don't know. I'll have to ask Intel on that. I don't know where to call them. Okay, so I'm really not going to go into all of these things because we can see that they're pretty much all the same. And up here again, we've got some caching, we've got available, we've got access, we've got present, but everything else, you know, on extra level. What we really care about here is the XD bit. This is from whence depth springs, right? You can't have depth data execution prevention unless you have page level granularity non execute. We could have if people were using segmentation, right? Segmentation, code segment, you know, it's non writable. Data segment, non executable. 
right? Not using segmentation. They end up, you know, using supervisor, user, check stuff. They end up using read, write. But there was no way built in to the page level protections to have read, write, execute, right? No execute bit. So they had to add a no execute bit. All right. So I want to quickly talk about this um, PAE convention. So slightly different, but exactly the same concept. So the hardware doesn't use this. The operating system sets this up for its own convenience. The funny thing here is operating system sets this up for its own convenience, and it doesn't have to do like any extra math because of this extra page directory pointer entry and stuff like that. Because it kind of just assumes it's like you took four page directories and you put them back to back. So before we had that big array of page tables with one page directory at the top. Now their convention is kind of just pretending like you got page, four page directories at the top and again still just like a ton of page tables, right? So they kind of, per convention, just completely ignore the directory pointer table, right? But the hardware doesn't. So this is a point that really took me a while to figure this out when I was trying to do the aforementioned reading user space memory kernel. Hardware doesn't ignore that. You need to understand how the CR3 points at that, and unfortunately I didn't put it in here, but really should have because that's like the key. It turns out, whereas previously the CR3 specifies, you know, 20 bits for like some 4 kilobyte aligned address, here with these tables, they're not aligned, and that was what was screwing me up. I was assuming take whatever's in CR3, treat it as an aligned <coughs> address, and go there, because if you look at the CR3, you'll find out, hey, that's not you know, 4 kilobyte aligned. What am I supposed to do with it? Oh, maybe I just dropped the last, you know, three nibbles. Assume it's four kilobyte aligned. No. It turns out to be the actual exact address of one of these entries, and there's four of them in a little table. So you've got to go to that location, treat it as this data structure here, suck out the 24-bit physical address of a now actually page-aligned directory table. All right, so that, like I said, is pretty much it. All I wanted to say about PA. Everything's pretty much the same. Different conventions, so you just need to know this math. Um, I'll let you look at that on your own. So if you're trying to do, you know, memory analysis and kernel and stuff like that, or if you're trying to walk page tables, you know these conventions that Windows uses for itself in order to always access its page directories and page tables. You don't even have to care about that little extra table. Uh, you can use this to always find stuff and map stuff. There's some math proving it. If you did, you know, PTE command now on a rebooted system and using the exact same address as before, you'll get, you know, different things like we saw before. Before it was C03 something, something, something. Now it's C06 something, something, something. But again, they just take like the top 11 bits. So that includes that two bits of table, nine bits of directory. That is lost. But this is, you know, again, conceptually the same, that you're just going to skip the table, go straight to a giant page for purposes of TLB caching. So on Windows NT kernel PAE, right here, this is the PAE version of the kernel. If you go in and look at the PTE for some of its memory ranges, you'll see that it is actually mapping to a 2 megabyte page. All right. So a little more discussion of the NX bit. You'll hear this called the NX bit more than you'll hear it called the XD bit. Uh, AMD executed this sort of extension first when, when they were, you know, trying to extend the. Uh, so the point is, you know, when Intel first wanted to do 64-bit systems, right? They wanted to go to Itanium, which was like a completely different, non-backwards compatible architecture. And, you know, they've learned hard over the years that people really, really want backwards compatibility from them. But AMD learned that faster or whatever. They took it more seriously. So AMD said, yeah, we'll just uh, hack x86 to make it 64-bit mode now. So in the process of doing that, stuff like that, uh, they came up with the NX bit to add back in to hardware this capability which people had already been proving was useful in software. So there were things like I can't even remember all the names, Exec Shield or Stack Guard or Shack. But there were software projects which, in order to try to combat things like buffer overflows, we wanted to, you know, cancel out those 
um, initial, you know, simple buffer overflows where you're overwriting on the stack, you're, you know, smashing the saved instruction pointer on the stack, and then, so it's like you put in a buffer that has a bunch of assembly code, and then you eventually overwrite the stack, the instruction pointer. When you return, you return back into the assembly code which you put in your data. But code should never be executing on the stack. For normal applications, there's some small exceptions to that, things that do just-in-time compilation. Then it shouldn't be on the stack. So the point is people were trying to stop these buffer overflows by saying, look, we don't want anyone to ever execute something on the stack. And that's, that's called like write XOR execute capability. I think that's what you know, BSD, whatever. BSDs call that, you know, write XOR execute capability. Other people call it, you know, not executable stack, things like that. But the point is just if it's writable, you know, and it's and it's uh, executable, right? Write and execute. If you execute XORing one and one, uh, the result is zero, right? So you should not have writable and executable at the same time. That should not be possible. But if it's writable and not executable, that's okay. If it's executable and not writable, that's okay. One and zero, zero and one, one, go for it. And if it's, you know, non-writable and non-executable, yeah, well, that's kind of a problem. Well, no, it's not necessarily a problem. If you really just want to it. But it's not a security issue. All right, so, yeah, we know that segmentation did have a way of preventing memory from being executable, but no, no one uses it. We use page level protection. Page level protections didn't have any notion about executability. That's why they had to have a bit in PAE and or bit modes. Mm -hmm. The only thing this one is saying is that, like I just said, the first time it's set, so if you set it at the page directory pointer table level, right, it propagates down to all of the page directory, page table, etc. Set at the page directory, it propagates down to all the page tables. Set it on the page table entry, it propagates to exactly one page. If you try to execute something, again, the hardware knows whether this is an instruction access or a data access. If it sees you're trying to do an instruction access, then it's doing its little sanity check. If instruction access and XD bit is equal to one, then throw a page wall. Another case of uh, page wall. Right. And anyways, I forgot to quite make this thing, but anyways, Intel, AMD came up with the point first, and X, they implemented it, and then Intel also implemented it and just called it XD. So if you look in the manuals, look for XD and then X. And so the point is, Microsoft markets the use, the, the fact that their system is using this execute disable page level protection, they call that data execution prevention. Specifically, hardware debt. So they're referring to the fact that it's the hardware that's enforcing this, right? Your memory thing is walking. Your hardware is walking these page tables you set up. And if you, you know, try to access something for execution that's marked as non-executable, the hardware throws the page fault. They have a separate thing which you should not be confused with called software debt. And I'm pretty sure this is still turned on when you, you know, you turn on debt, you get both software and hardware. But software debt is trying to prevent a different, um, type of buffer overflow, structured exception handler overflow, which is really just like a giant overflow where you overflow so far on the stack that you eventually hit these structured exception handlers, which are you know, out on the stack. And I'm sure Corey will tell you all about that in his exploits. We'll, uh, we'll leave the discussions of this to class. So do we need me to move my mic or something or what? Do you have echo? Move my mic up better. You're okay. It's basically a sense. Okay. okay. Alright, thank you. And we would investigate NX and this says that I couldn't find anything, but it turns out these exact values down here, they work. I copied these off of the internet because when I couldn't find anything by just like manually looking around, but if you go and try those values, you will see they give the same thing. That, when you're using PTE on the thing, you're going to get these 64-bit structures saying, oh, here's a 64-bit structure, that's a page directory entry. Here's a 64-bit structure, that's a page table entry. 
And if something is marked as NX, as this particular thing is, then you should expect the most significant bit of the page directory or page table entry to be set to 1 to signify non-executable. And it goes back to that, you know, phantom E flag when they were trying to uh, help us out and say on PA We see finally that the E flag does, dis does disappear. Right, and this we've pretty much like totally covered a bunch of times. Um, but you know, one of the points of the OS is as our pictures before showed, it's trying to like separate different processes, protecting itself from the processes, and it's trying to protect them from each other, right? And so um, we already many times talked about you swap around CR3s for completely different page table translation things in order to get different processes. In order to have each process have an isolated group. Uh, Right, and we already, you know, jumped ahead to talk about shared memory. There are cases where you want to share physical memory between multiple virtual memory spaces. You don't want to waste physical memory. And also another case would be, for instance, interprocess communication. You want to share memory so that they can talk between each other. But a key point is that in order to do that sort of thing, the OS is going to have to know that these things are trying to talk through memory to each other. So it's going to have to expose some sort of API in order to say, like, you want to talk to that process. First, you know, see if you can open the process handle, then pass that process handle to me and say, you know, what memory range you want, and then, you know, that other one should do the same. There's going to have to be some sort of API in order to use this for interprocess communication. Is that like even sockets or am I thinking mm. like kind of I don't know. Are using sockets implemented as shared physical memory? Out it, but it's possible. I mean, in some cases, it's just sockets and they're mapping it to the device or something. I don't know. Good question. You tell me. You know enough now. You can figure it out. All right. So this was our picture of you know many memory spaces, some to different physical, some to the same physical, and this was what it all looked like in sort of. You got something which eventually, whether it's at the page table level or whether it's at the page, you know, actual page level, that's how you can share memory between OS can have isolated instances on isolation. If we put it that way. All right, so tearing down on this section, we'll start thinking of your questions now. The miscellaneous uh, instructions we picked up along the way, not so much here. Just uh, two instructions saying moving to and from control registers. There's only a register to register. Then there's the invalidate page table entry in the TLD. So you can say invalidate page and you kick an entry out. All right. Anyone have any questions on paging?